Good morning, everybody. It's um, finally nice to welcome you to Albion Chambers. Uh, this is not a virtual background. These are real colleagues. They are real books, and that's a real window. Uh, you won't see any virtual background wobbling behind us. Just to put you in the picture of what's a little bit of feedback there. Apologies, everybody. Just to put you in, um, into the picture about what's going to be happening today, things are, of course, going to happen differently. Uh, do excuse me, everybody. Um, just to put you in the picture about everything that's happening today, as you can see, there are going to be technical issues. This is the first time we've ever attempted something like this before. And this is very much a shakedown of how this technology is going to work in the future. I know you're a forgiving lot, I know you're a loyal lot, um, and please blame me, uh, the mistakes are always mine. But first of all, I wish you were here. I wish that you were here in the room with us so we could deliver the seminars that we like to deliver. You know that we don't do the formal set pieces, we don't lecture you in these seminars. You're our friends and colleagues. And what we love is that interaction, those questions, <laughs> the leg pulling that often happens. Yes, Steve, I'm looking at you. Uh, and also the little bit of la bad language and Karis, I'm now looking at you now. Um, but that all adds to the day for us. So everything we're trying to achieve today is to get as close to that way of delivering a seminar as we possibly can. It's not going to be perfect, but hopefully it will really help. Uh, so a few bits of housekeeping before we begin. Please, can you make sure, so it's going to be in the bottom left-hand side of your screen, please can you mute your microphones and also mute your video. This isn't because I don't want to see your lovely, happy, smiling faces. It's because we need to preserve as much bandwidth through Zoom as we possibly can to make sure that our video and our audio reaches you as the best quality it possibly can. When we've got so many people online, if we start to have video and audio from everybody, it becomes very difficult indeed. But to build in that level of interaction that we've talked about, there's a chat function. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a little chat function with a speech bubble. Please click on that and it will bring up a sidebar where you're able to type in whatever you have said. So for instance, I've already seen from um, uh, Alex uh, a question, why hasn't it started yet? Well, it's because I'd forgotten to plug in the camera. That's the main reason. Um, but what we'd like is in relation to that chat function, it is available to everybody. We didn't want to limit it in any way, shape or form, but we have a big screen in front of us down here where if you have any questions as we go along, if you could just put a load of stars and then your question, we'll be able to answer those questions as we go along. Um, I hope that all makes sense. So in terms of the seminars that I would like to deliver, these are previous seminars all around Bristol where you're there with us. But we've had to make some other changes as well. For instance, I had to have a haircut six weeks ago. Not the week before a seminar to try and look smart, but knowing that my hair was going to have to grow into this event. But I'd just like to highlight this little one here. This is my youngest, Nora. Look at the delight on her face at the prospect of the butchery that's about to take place on my beautiful head of hair. I think that look is reminiscent of the penultimate Par uh, penultimate chapter of Lord of the Flies when things get very dark indeed and if you want to see how it was going here we are um, my lovely head of hair whether there's sufficient hair left to grow back I simply don't know but what are the changes have we had to make to deliver this seminar well the speakers are all in the same room we're socially distanced we're two meters apart it's all been measured properly we have traffic routes running around this building, this room, so we're able to deliver this to you without crossing paths. We'll be deliberately wiping down our stations. 
after each move and after each talk. And therefore, complying with the regulations to the absolute letter, but it does mean that it's going to be a touch agricultural between particular issues. But what else have we done? Well, we've got these traffic routes that I've talked about. You can see my beautifully sketched diagram there about how this is looking. But also, we have engaged truly the best in the business in delivering uh, audio and visual uh, techniques. Um, Sound Commercial do huge events across the country. And on Twitter right now, we're posting various photographs of the setup and the equipment of behind the scenes just to deliver what looks like a really simple approach. Uh, I'm very happy to speak to you about it. Paul Fletcher, our Chambers Director, who's sitting in the corner, is very happy to talk to you about the technology behind it if you want to deliver these types of seminars to your clients. Ask us what went well, ask us what went badly. We will give you an absolute honest answer. We've also got two brilliant technicians in the room as well. Uh, Jerry, who's sitting over there, and Kyle, who's behind the camera. Again, it looks simple, but the amount of thought and effort that goes into this um, has been incredible. We have individual microphones, so we're not sharing the same space. Um, all of these aspects add extra layers of complication, and therefore, again, please forgive us if we have just the odd technical glitch. But let's make a start. These are the changes that we've had to make in relation to the seminar that we are delivering. Uh, from Alex May, something is far too small. Um, it's, a, it's a private message. So Alex, you need to work on your settings there. Um, are you able to read the slides? I can't see them properly too small. Well, that's why we have the big TV here. So just in case you are struggling to see the slides as a, a, an inbuilt area of your screen, these should be easier to view. Of course, if you use a bigger device, that will be easier. So we've had to make these changes as well. But what has this done about our day job? Well, this is a picture of a calendar for those who can't see the slides on their device. Our latest case that we've listed is November 2021, third, fourth and fifth. It was meant to be a trial in the last couple of weeks that's when it's been adjourned to. Therefore, you in the audience, let's just start using this chat function. Please, can you just type in what's your latest listing that you're currently facing for a trial that you have at the moment? Uh, as those start to roll in, September 2021 from Laura. Okay, we've beaten you on that. Feb 20, oh, okay, that's not too bad, James. Uh, just keep those coming in. So we as a group, we as a group of colleagues, can, um, Tudor, would you be good enough not to share your screen, please? So at the bottom of the um, picture, there'll be a, a, probably a green button saying share screen. Could you click that off? Because of the listing difficulties, because of CV19, we know that we're going to have to make compromises. And one of the big problems with this is to have a judge and two wingers for discrimination type cases is very difficult to do. Matt Jackson in due course is going to be talking to you about the cloud video platform about how that that's working and in fact Alex Small who's talking today as well did a trial a three-day contested discrimination trial using CVP but here's the thing we can do a little bit better than how we're currently doing it. There's a solution. This is embedded in the back of our minds. We all know this, but we've never had to think about it before. So section 43E of the Employment Tribunals Act allows a judge to sit alone for those discrimination type cases should the parties agree for that way forward. Now, anecdotally, we know that very rarely do two wingers outvote the employment judge when it comes to a decision at the end of the case. So although our preference would always be to have a panel of three, 
in these circumstances, I do wonder if justice delayed is justice denied. And therefore, why not get together with our opponents at an early stage, agree that our discrimination type cases can be heard by a judge sitting alone, and then invite the tribunal to list it with a judge sitting alone or to consider that position. And it's far more likely that a judge sitting alone will be able to undertake a trial much sooner than trying to deal with the two wingers as well. Now, I suspect, of course, the employment judge, uh, judges know about this particular section, but I doubt they can be seen to be encouraging this particular way of litigating because they are often a panel of three. But if you come to the conclusion with your opponents and having taken instructions from your clients that it's not going to do damage to your case, why not agree it and therefore get these trials on much sooner? So I hope that is one way that we can achieve a little bit of movement in relation to um, uh, litigating and having trials back in the employment tribunals. I said Alec did one a week or so ago and it ran perfectly smoothly uh, and therefore it is quite possible but it does take a far greater emphasis on front-end preparation. So let's move on to the main part of my talk. Jerry would you reset the timer to the main part of the talk please? Uh, my main part of the talk is going to be on vulnerable parties in the employment tribunal because as you'll have seen in recent weeks there's been some new presidential guidance uh, in relation to um, this tricky issue. What this talk isn't however is a training course to make you competent advocates in dealing with vulnerable witnesses. Um, I deliver that talk, I deliver that course on behalf of the Western Circuit in relation to crime and that course is a full day course with small breakout groups because we've got to reprogram ourselves about how we ask questions. And similarly, in preparation for that course, the delegates tell me that it takes between six and eight hours to prepare their questions so they can then be dissected during the course as part of that reprogramming. I'm currently writing a course to deliver a vulnerable witness advocacy course that's likely to be ready in the autumn but unless we can all be together that method of teaching isn't going to work but as I'll tell you in in due course we've got to make sure that we're on top of this. I've also been trained in relation to vulnerable witnesses and the vulnerable witness scheme um, is my job as a part-time Crown Court judge uh, and I've conducted trials both as judge and advocate dealing with vulnerable witnesses and the rules surrounding it. So where are we in terms of employment? Well, the criminal procedure rules make provision for vulnerable parties. The criminal procedure rules have been doing this and the criminal courts have been doing this for probably three or four years or thereabouts. The family is just behind, the family proceedings are just behind. They're about 18 months to two years, but are starting to really catch up with crime. And although the civil procedure rules don't currently provide for vulnerable parties, uh, there is a working group making provision for that. It's the Civil Justice Council, uh, and that will be engaged fairly soon. But the difficulty is, in employment, the tribunal rules are largely silent. And that's extraordinary, isn't it? Because the nature of the cases that we deal with, the nature of disabilities, for instance, we as a body of lawyers are well used to dealing with um, those with disabilities, those with vulnerabilities. But we've got to, again, rephrase what we're doing. We've got to reimagine how we approach these matters. This isn't just about reasonable adjustments under the Equality Act. This is far wider, it's far more nuanced, and it isn't just about disability. Because as we'll see in due course, other factors, religion, background, the nature of the case, think about somebody who has been sacked for whistleblowing. That person may be become vulnerable by virtue of what's been happening. 
So it's a far wider, far more subtle, far more engaged approach that we all need to adopt. But I say it's odd that employment is so far behind. So what has the presidential guidance done? How does it help us or hinder us? Well, first of all, the presidential guidance simply steals, by direct reference, the Civil Justice Council recommendations and also the crime and family procedurals, so paragraphs 8, 12 and 17, of the presidential guidance. Because the president says there's no obvious need to reinvent the wheel. Well, that's right so far as it goes. But the difficulty is we're taking a wheel from a race car and we're sticking it on a tractor. Yes, it's round. Yes, it turns. And yes, it makes a vehicle go forward. But I'm afraid to say that there's no obvious need to in, uh, reinvent the wheel. Actually isn't true. Because you'll see as we go through the slides and we go through the presidential guidance and other guidance, there are lacunas, there are tensions that don't quite apply in the employment tribunal field. But here's an important point. We can read the presidential guidance. The presidential guidance says there's no need to reinvent the wheel. It makes direct reference to the Civil Justice Council, the Crime and Family Procedurals and various other documents as well. That means we have to have read the Civil Justice Council documents, the Crime and Family Procedurals and all the other documents because they're not reinventing the wheel, they're simply dragging it in to the presidential guidance. And that puts a huge responsibility and onus on us as employment lawyers, not just to be experts in our own field, but also to get involved in other fields, because I'm afraid to say the presidential guidance uses this, this sleight of hand, there's no obvious need to reinvent the wheel. I disagree. But let's start building our foundation stones. Let's start having a think about how this is going to be fitting together. Um, the, I hope the camera positioning has now changed so we can see uh, the full screen. Um, so looking at the foundation stones, this is this wider remit that I've been talking about. Paragraph four of the presidential guidance, there is no universal definition of vulnerability for this purpose, but a good test of vulnerability might be whether the person is likely to suffer fear or distress in giving evidence because of their own circumstances or those relating to the case. Imagine the person who suffered horrendous abuse, racism, sexism, because of their sexuality, whatever it might be. Can you imagine that person who has been subject to that abuse by their manager over a long period of time and they finally had enough final straw territory, constructive unfair dismissal and the usual claims of discrimination. That person, let's say they're a litigant in person, a claimant, has to face the person they're accusing head on. So they don't have to have an innate characteristic to be vulnerable. The case itself can give them that vulnerability. The circumstances of the tribunal can give them that vulnerability. So we've got to be so cute, we've got to be so tuned in in relation to these matters uh, to be able to spot these as they come. But of course, their own circumstances we can probably come up with a list between you and I uh, about uh, what those circumstances could be. Again, what part of this talk is about is about making you think more widely, more subtly, uh, and again, just engaging in those papers much earlier. Uh, but another example, it seems to me, is let's say a young worker. Let's say somebody working at their local pizza shop um, and they earn a few quid a week and they're a 16 year old. Somebody could be vulnerable just by virtue of their age. It's their first job, they're not worldly wise, uh, they don't have the confidence of some, therefore just that one feature might be enough to make them vulnerable. 
Next. Although the employment tribunal rules don't provide for the machinery to deal with vulnerable witnesses as bluntly as I'd like, we do have rule two, the requirement to deal with a case justly. And I think if we start from that foundation to deal with a case justly, and all of our arguments about vulnerable witnesses develop from there, then in those circumstances, I'm not sure we're going to go too far wrong. But justly does include competing interests, doesn't it? We've got to be just to both sides. So we could have a litigant in person claimant who is vulnerable for whatever reason. And let's say they want a particular mechanism to shield them from the difficulties faced by the employment tribunal. Let's say that we've got to modify the way that we question people, for instance. Well, a respondent might say, well, that's unfair on us because we can't put our case properly. We can't put our case with the force and the vigor that we want to put it. But that's why we need to engage with these issues early. We can't ask a judge on the day to make decisions about how this is going to work. It needs to be earlier than that. Let's move on. Of course, within a tribunal, we're still at our foundation stones within the tribunal, we've got the Equality Act 2010. That duty to make reasonable adjustments that I've talked about. It's standalone, but it's interrelated in relation to the other issues. Of course, we've got um, the uh, reasonable adjustments. This is set out at paragraph 27 of the presidential guidance. Uh, but paragraph 27 dodges whether this duty to make reasonable adjustments under the Equality Act applies to Her Majesty's Court and Tribunal Service. So although the tribunal says, yes, Equality Act, reasonable adjustments, no problem. What the presidential guidance then goes on to say is, well, I'm not going to say one way or another whether it actually applies to the bricks and mortar of a court and the machinery that goes on behind the scenes of a court or tribunal. So again, that's why I say the presidential guidance is flawed because it's not good enough simply not to reinvent the wheel. We've got to know how to attach that wheel onto our particular vehicle. And again, and I'm sorry to say it, it means it's gonna put more pressure on us as lawyers, you as lawyers, of grappling with these issues, at least in the short term. But what else can we use? What else, what other levers can we pull in relation to vulnerable witnesses? Well, of course, the ECHR Article 6 and Article 14 also are important. And also Article 13 of the UN, UN Charter in relation to disabilities. Again, we may get some use and uh, help from that one way or the other. But this case here is going to be an important one. The CPS against Fraser. This is a case which says that the Equal Treatment Bench Book which is another one of our foundation stones. So the Equal Treatment Bench Book is designed for judges. It applies across the board. But the Equal Treatment Bench Book, acting as one of our foundation stones, is now incorporated, is now given bite by the case of CPS against Fraser. And just to give a little bit, bit of background about that case, um, a person who used to work for the Crown Prosecution Service uh, brought a claim in the employment tribunals. And the correspondence that the claimant entered into was rather odd. And what was being said in that correspondence was rather odd. The tribunal, by making reference to the Equal Treatment Bench Book, uh, took a very um, generous, um, open-armed, open-handed approach in relation to this correspondence. And eventually it allowed that claim to go forward and certain findings were made. The CPS said, oh no, this is all, this isn't fair. You're not treating us even handedly because the Equal Treatment Bench Book 
um, shouldn't apply in such a strict way. It, it doesn't act as that sort of shield. But in fact, on appeal, the court said, uh, no, we disagree. Um, the equal treatment bench book is one of those foundation stones that a tribunal is allowed to use in order to conclude uh, or make conclusions in this area. I also reference chapters two and four um, of the appendices to the uh, Equal Treatment Bench Book. I'm not going to take you through them now, uh, but they give some really helpful practical views, um, practical examples of what sort of reasonable adjustments, not in the Equality Act sense of the word, but the wider Equal Treatment Bench Book um, sense of the word, that might be applied in a case such as this. Right at the bottom of my slide, I've given you a link. I think as Paul has um, put on the, yes, as Steve, sorry, has put on the uh, chat, all these slides are going to be emailed to everybody afterwards. So that will deal with that. Uh, so it's worth reading the case of CPS against Fraser because it will give you a good view of how everything interrelates on that. Uh, it also deals with the exceptions to the tribunal's obligations in relation to reasonable adjustments. Again, it's something that you need to go through. We don't have time today. Um, so all well and good. We've got our foundation stones in place. It's not perfect. But we've got a wheel. We've somehow managed to attach it to our vehicle. Um, it's clunking along, but fair enough. We're grown-ups. We can deal with this. We're, we're, we're good lawyers. Uh, but so far, so good. But the difficulty is, is this. ET judges and members, this is what's said in the presidential guidance, receive regular training on discrimination, law and practice, equal treatment and judicial communication. Great, wonderful. So do we. We're lawyers as well. Such training already addresses issues of vulnerability and vulnerable persons. Wonderful. It sounds so far in the presidential guidance that there's no dramas. The, the judges are already up to speed in this. But then we have this third bullet point. The president recommends and requires that such national and regional training takes full account of this presidential guidance. Full account. So are these training courses for our employment judges going to go and look at the civil procedure rules when they're amended? The criminal procedure rules, the family procedure rules, because remember, they're simply dragged across by that sleight of hand we see about not reinventing the wheel. But this also tells you, doesn't it, that currently the vast majority, if not all, employment judges have not been trained in relation to the vulnerable witness presidential guidance and the other matters. It's quite a stark situation to be in. When advocates are required to do a full day's course, and these are experienced advocates required to do a full day course with six hours prep beforehand in order to be able to ask a single question of a vulnerable witness in crime. We've got judges who haven't yet been trained, but we're being asked to apply this presidential guidance now. But that means as lawyers, we need to be ahead of the game. That we need to help the judges navigate this new area. Uh, so I've tried to break it down into steps. Step one, we need to be trained. If we are not trained, how can we spot those cases early doors, that subtlety, that nuance that is different to that straightforward reasonable adjustments under the Equality Act? How can we deal with those sorts of cases? I'm not sure we can without proper training. We need to familiarise yourself with the Equal Treatment Bench Book. It's a bare minimum. If we are going to practice in the employment tribunals as an advocate or a litigator, it makes no odds because we have got to seize the reins nice and early on this. But here's the next one. This is probably the new material that isn't familiar to those who don't step out of employment. There's no criticism in that. There's no reason why you would. But this is new. TAG, the Advocates Gateway. And when I deliver this course on behalf of the Western Circuit to crime, it's all about the Advocates Gateway in truth. So what is 
and how does the advocate gateway work? Well, first of all, it's comprised, it's split into 18 or so toolkits. That's the way they phrase it. And each toolkit has an individual title that you can navigate to. Some won't be directly relevant to you as employment practitioners, but others will. But there's a difficulty because every toolkit within, even one that's relevant to you, links to another toolkit to borrow a bit of information. So I'm afraid to say we can't just chop out two thirds of the toolkits and say, not us gov, because the toolkits we are relying upon base some of what they say upon the other toolkits. They don't simply keep recycling the same information and dragging it across. You've got to go to it to read it. But here we are, the word we must be proficient in those toolkits. Next, let's have a look about what the Advocates Gateway looks like. This is your landing page. This is what you would first see. I'm just going to have a look around here first of all. Here, so towards the bottom left hand side of your slide, there's a training film. That training film is about crime. I think it's to do with a youth court first of all, and then there's a crown court as well. The video takes about 27 minutes and we all know training videos directed at lawyers are excruciating. They're hammed up, they're bad acting, bad sound, but I'm, afraid, but I'm happy to say this video is really, really good. It gives you the roles and the way that judges should be approaching things. It shows really competent advocates guiding a judge through the situation. And we'll return to the role of somebody called an intermediary in due course, but it shows a really good intermediary in action. So my advice to you, although you may be bored of looking at a video screen after this, is take 27 minutes of your time after this seminar is over and watch this training film because it's going to be the fastest way to get the feel of the situation, to get that, that touch about the sorts of things that we're going to have to consider. But what else have we got on this particular toolkit? Well, on the left hand side, we've got a link through to the toolkits generally, but of course on the right, we can begin to see a list of toolkits coming down. So first, ground rules hearings and the fair treatment of vulnerable people in court. We're gonna talk about ground rules hearings in a moment, but I'm not gonna train you about how to do a ground rules hearing because that's part of a day long course. Again, we, we can't fracture. These are signposts to what you need to know about. Then you can see the different titles down that right hand side um, as things have developed and the toolkits have been added. But what's next? If we, for instance, scroll down that same page, we'd get to here. Bottom corner, we can see the laptop and a book clearly showing that they're a lawyer. Um, a bit of stock imagery there. But right down at the bottom here, those cases are really important. Again, like that training video, if you just read half a dozen of the cases that they talk about, you're going to get a really good feel for the parameters and the types of discussion and cases that get, get litigated in relation to uh, vulnerable parties, vulnerable witnesses. Again, many of those are going to be crime. Almost all of them are, in fact, are crime. But beg, borrow and steal. Remember, we need to attach this wheel one way or another. But also let's look here as well. Number 12, it's in gray. That's because you currently don't have access to that particular toolkit, which is a problem, isn't it? If you are about to deal with a case dealing with general principles when questioning witnesses and defendants with mental disorder, you currently don't have a toolkit to help you with that. There are older versions of the toolkit knocking about that will give you some guidance, but these toolkits periodically do turn grey when they're being updated based upon judicial feedback, lawyers' feedback, case law, litigation, um, challenges via JR, all those sorts of things. 
So you will, I'm afraid to say time and again, see these turning gray and you won't have access to it. Let's also look at number 10 as well. Identifying vulnerability in witnesses and parties and making adjustments. Well, if we're not gonna do anything else other than watching the training video, don't we at least have to know number 10, backwards, forwards, and sideways? Think about the cases you've currently got on your desk. Do any of those have a potentially vulnerable witness? How do you know whether they do or not? How do you know what you need to do or how to consider them if you haven't first looked at number 10 and really studied it? I'm sorry to be so dictatorial in relation to this, but I'm going to come on to the reasons why in due course. Uh, and then finally, uh, well, not finally, uh, we've got uh, 16 intermediaries you also need to be looking at. But of course, the one that looks like it applies most to, what, uh, most to us is number 17, the vulnerable witnesses and parties in the civil courts. I am going to return to that one on its own in due course. But let's loop back to the presidential guidance. Let's see what further we support we can get from the presidential guidance for how this is going to work. It would be sensible to consider, uh, apologies everyone, I wouldn't ordinarily read it out, but I know some are struggling to see the slides. It would be sensible to consider whether a party's participation in the proceedings generally is likely to be diminished by reason of vulnerability. Full stop. If so, and subject to the views of the parties, the tribunal might decide whether to make appropriate directions or orders to facilitate participation. So we need to know what vulnerable parties look like in each individual case, early doors. I say we need to know before any preliminary hearing. Next, and this is the reason why I'm being so dictatorial about this, to be so blunt and plain about this. Paragraph six of the guidance. The tribunal and parties need to identify any party or witness who is a vulnerable person at the earliest possible stage of proceedings. Need. There is no equivocation there. That is a warning shot to all of us that the employment tribunal guidance is putting us on notice that it's us, not just the tribunal, but it's us, the parties that need to identify at this stage. But we also further go down, uh, go further down, sorry, the earliest possible stage of proceedings. This applies to both lawyers for the claimant and lawyers for the respondent. So a respondent lawyers might have to highlight to, not might, will have to highlight to the tribunal if they believe the claimant or one of the claimant's witnesses might be vulnerable and might require directions to help with that case. It's a huge responsibility, especially when the, nobody's gonna pay for it. And I'll move on to that in a moment as well. So what's next? Well, we need to identify those cases that may require directions to cater for a vulnerable party either because of their own characteristics or the nature of the case. It goes back to my step one. We need to train ourselves. It's as simple as that. But let's go further. The orders or measures concerned may fall to be considered by the tribunal of its own initiative. So you might be ambushed with this if you turn up at a preliminary hearing and the tribunal says, well, I think this person is vulnerable. What are we gonna do about it? So again, we've got to be on our toes. Or on the application of the party. Uh, application is an overly formal term here. I think it's simply notify the tribunal that you want the judge to have a look at this. That's what application means in these circumstances. Uh, next. It deals with a long list of bits of vulnerability and matters that need to be considered when a tribunal is making these types of 
decision. The actual or perceived potential intimidation. Well, think about whistleblowing. It's an easy one to think about, isn't it? Physical or mental disability. Well, we're good at that. We know that we're employment lawyers. That's our bread and butter. The age matter. I mentioned earlier, the 16 year old who works in the pizza shop, for instance, might fall into that category. The cultural background of a party. Is the witness from a religion or has a belief system where, for instance, they don't interact or shouldn't interact directly with men without being in the presence of a family member, as an example? But again, there are dozens of other examples that might fall into that. The nature of the questions to be put. Let's say a... Um, a claimant is, has been sacked and they want to say, well, the reason why I was sacked is because I whistle blew, um, because I was in a relationship with my manager and that turns sour. And therefore I want to put questions to my manager about our relationship because that was discussed in the workplace later on. Let's just use that example. So suddenly it's not the claimant who's vulnerable anymore. It's the manager who's going to be a witness in the proceedings because the manager is going to be asked questions about their private and personal life that they had with the claimant when they were still a happy couple. So very quickly, I think probably, and I hope it's fair to say, we were all thinking about claimant litigants in person. They're going to be the vulnerable ones. They're the ones that are going to be looking after. But no, depending on the circumstances, it's just as likely Maybe that's overstating it. There is no reason to suspect that respondent witnesses shouldn't have exactly the same protections as vulnerable parties in this case. But here's an interesting one, second to bottom point. One of the things to think about for the tribunal is how much it's gonna cost. It's not justice at any price. But similarly, and it's a really important one, and it's about people feeling powered and feeling strong to conduct litigation. We need to take on board the views of the vulnerable party because there are many people who you or I may identify on the papers as vulnerable and say, well, maybe they need a screen, maybe they need to give evidence via video link, whatever it might be. But that vulnerable party, they say, no, 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 no. I wanna be there. I want to see what happens. I want to ask those questions. So just because we might come to an initial judgment that they are vulnerable and therefore raise it with the judge, the judge must take into account the views of that potentially vulnerable party also. I've mentioned them all. Okay, ground force, ground rules is a tenuous connection in truth, but I was doing my best, it was late. Ground rules hearings. Again, it's not a phrase that we're used to using in employment tribunals, but it's a very common phrase in crime and family now. Employment tribunal rules don't mention it at all, don't provide for it, but that doesn't mean that ground rules hearings can't take place. Uh, and I would say you need to bolt them on either to a preliminary hearing or at a hearing in advance of the trial. You don't really want to be doing it on the day of trial. So paragraph seven of the presidential guidance says, consider setting ground rules. And that includes consideration of the conduct of representatives. Now, what does that mean, conduct? Well, conduct could be the way that we ask questions. Conduct might be, well, I want to go really bootsy on this witness because we want to prove that they're liars and that this is, whole thing is a fiction. Let's go bootsy. Sometimes they're my instructions. Whether that's right or not is a different question. But in fact, the conduct of representatives, the tribunal might put handcuffs on the advocate and say, no, you can't go full-blooded with this witness. You can't have the big swings. You need to ask your questions differently because of their vulnerability. It's a curious world to be in where a judge is telling us that yes, you're acting perfectly properly, your questions are perfectly sound and valid, but in this particular case, we're going to handcuff you in relation to it. Paragraph 21, the tribunal will expect 
and require familiarity with the rules from representatives. Let's just pause there. Require. Again, we go back to that previous word, the need word. If we're doing this sort of litigation, we need, we are required to have this. And here's the real kicker. Paragraph 21 of the presidential guidance makes direct reference to your and my professional regulators and our codes of conduct, whether that be through legal exec, barrister, solicitor. What they're telling us here is if we don't get this right, because we don't know it, that's a professional conduct issue. And that's why I'm being so firm and so blunt about it. Um, and I'm sorry for being that way, but we need to know this. There's been a number of advocates across the country over the last four years who have got into trouble because they haven't known their stuff in relation to vulnerable witnesses. But let's move on. Actually, I'm just going to pause there a moment. Let's go back to consideration of the conduct of the representatives. Now's probably the best time to deal with this. That can even include a judge vetting your questions in advance. So can you imagine that? You're setting your carefully timed trap. You're closing off the doors like we're all taught to do. And there's the whammy question at the end. Well, the reason why that document is, it exists is because you faked it, isn't it? Well, if the faker is a vulnerable party, a judge and your opposite number who might be representing that vulnerable party will or may have sight of your questions in advance to vet how you're going to answer them, uh, ask them. Just let that sink in. So if your style of advocacy, and it's a good style of advocacy, is setting traps, and it's how we teach our pupils, but if that's your style of advocacy, if you're dealing with a vulnerable party, you're going to be able to have to make that point in a different way without springing a trap. It's a different way of thinking. So relevant measures. What do vulnerable witness measures look like? Well, preventing a party or a witness from seeing or being seen by another party. Well, it's more difficult on the cloud video platform or on Zoom or whatever to be able to compartmentalize it. But it might be simply a direction from the judge to say, um, Joe Bloggs, please can you turn off your screen whilst that person is being cross-examined? It's as simple as that, because that would take away that particular pressure. To give evidence from another location by Skype or telephone. Well, we're going to hear about um, CVP in a moment, but that's not just going to be applying to vulnerable witnesses from now on, is it? But at least that's one thing that's uh, capable of being delivered. Providing a device to help communication. So despite, for instance, the rules against not recording proceedings, um, an employment judge might say, yes, you can record today's proceedings, so you can listen to it overnight, because maybe you've got a problem with memory, making you vulnerable, and therefore it will refresh your memory by the following day, so you're able to take an effective, active part in the case. Providing for a party or witness to be assisted by an intermediary or British Sign Language interpreter. Now, just pausing on uh, BSL interpreter for a moment, Lucy, who you're going to be hearing from, in due course is currently learning sign language. I'm very much hoping she's going to show us some of that later. But moving back to the intermediary. Intermediaries are there to facilitate communication. That's probably the easiest way of describing them. But that could mean a wide variety of issues. And therefore the employment tribunal can make provision for that to happen. Uh, but for instance, an intermediary in a case that I was the judge on uh, was a brilliant intermediary. There had been a ground rules hearing in advance of the case, but we had a little mini ground rules hearing right at the start of the trial, just to make sure that anything had changed. And the intermediary told me about the vulnerable witness in that case, 
that in fact something had been missed. That this person, because of his particular conditions, um, used to have seizures when he got too hot. This trial was last year uh, in the summer. So that intermediary to assist the communication of that individual made sure that fans were brought into the witness room to keep that particular witness cool to facilitate that communication so that person could take effective participation in the case. So the very best intermediaries are brilliant because they oil the wheels allowing that party to take a full and proper part in procedures and in proceedings. But what's next? Para 22 again dragging in the crime civil and family uh, practice um, uh, procedurals. Video recorded evidence in chief. Again it doesn't really apply to employment tribunals does it? Because we know our statements are read. That's why I say it's not about reinventing the wheel. Evidence by deposition where permitted by the CPR. Again we sort of already have that. M maybe not quite. But pre-recorded cross-examination or re-examination. Well why, why might that be done? Well there's section 28 in the Crown Court, for instance, allows vulnerable witnesses, generally in sex cases, to be cross-examined in advance in a sterile environment by the advocate. Fine, it can be ordered, uh, it seems, in the employment tribunal. But suddenly that's in advance. We may want to do that because let's say the witness, let's say it's some racist behaviour in the workplace and the victim of that racist behaviour um, had their daughter with them who was six and the daughter saw that racist behavior the racist behavior is denied by the respondent and therefore you're going to call the daughter well if we've got a tribunal booked in November 2021 or wherever is latest depending on our running total that child is going to be seven or eight by the time they gave evidence and they saw something happen when they were five or six we know children's memory is far more elastic than grown-ups memory and therefore that memory might become more unreliable so it might be if we've got a case in november 2021 that we need to conduct the cross-examination in a month's time that's then preserved like a time capsule ready to be used by the time we get to tribunal in a year or two's time but the difficulty is is it going to be the same advocate well, that's going to have to be factored into listing because me as an advocate might have conducted that cross-examination differently to somebody else. But if I've got to adopt that cross-examination later on for when I'm conducting that hearing, well, where's the fairness in that? So if that has to happen, well, we need to make provision for a continuity of representation at that stage. We've got use of appropriate language. We've got the avoidance of jargon and idiom. All those good things that as advocates, as communicators, we should be good at. But let's be honest, we all fall into the trap now and again. But here's the odd one. Questioning of a witness by the judge. This causes eyebrows to be raised in crime and family. It's a real problem and advocates rail against it because it doesn't feel right. For us in the employment tribunals, we know that half of the cases are conducted in this way already so in this respect the employment tribunals are ahead of the game they're more experienced in dealing with these sorts of issue let's move on but how is it going to be paid for paragraph 14 when deciding to make an order the list includes two relevant features whether any me measure is available to the tribunal and the costs of any available measure Paragraph 16, once the order is made, it may then become necessary for the court service, a measure uh, court and tribunal service, to be advised by the tribunal of what may be required. So the tribunal can't pull this lever and make it happen. It has to reference the Majesty's court and tribunal service. But we, we go further, underlining this lack of lever pulling. The tribunal may not order public funding to be available to provide such measures. That's a matter for Her Majesty's Court Service. 
Nevertheless, some public funding for medical reports or evidence might be available in some circumstances. Inquiry by the party or witness should first be made, etc., etc. This isn't a well-trodden path. You're going to be at the vanguard of this, having these arguments with civil servants, with um, individuals you'll never meet uh, about funding available for these types of measures. But looping back to our toolkits, As I said earlier, not all two toolkits are directly relevant to the ETs, but they do have this cross-linking between them. So we need to be familiar with all of them. But the one that we're zooming in on, of course, is Toolkit 17 or East 17. Uh, again, a tenuous connection just because I was getting bored putting the slides together. But this is the vulnerable witnesses and parties in the civil courts. And this is the starting point. And in a way, this is the end point. Advocates must adapt to the witness, not the other way round. Our job always has to be uh, to control the witness, to influence the witness, to make them adapt themselves to us, to give ourselves an advantage on behalf of our client. But when it comes to vulnerable witnesses, it works exactly the other way round. We must adapt to the witness. So going back to the springing of the trap, if that's not an appropriate way of questioning a particular witness, we have to adapt our techniques to make it work. Similarly, if you are a person who scripts questions in the employment tribunal, and there's nothing wrong with that, lots of people do, but you read one question, put it to your client, put it to the witness, move on to the next, that isn't going to work because we need to adapt. If that question doesn't work, we need to change it and move on to those um, better points. So that linear approach to preparation might not be as effective in relation to vulnerable witnesses. Uh, next, the role of the intermediary. Lots of case law about this. There are good and there are bad intermediaries. They are not created equal. Uh, there's a great case about um, called Biddle, where the intermediary refused to provide a report and to attend a hearing unless they were also instructed to attend a trial and be engaged and paid for a trial. Uh, but there is a register of intermediaries that are used for the criminal cases and you may want to look at the names from those and engage them privately if you need to. But the difficulty is for the funding for intermediaries, registered intermediaries from this panel are funded by the Ministry of Justice and they're only available to support vulnerable witnesses in the criminal justice system. There is no similar facility um, in relation to vulnerable witnesses in civil proceedings. That's toolkit seven, but that might be being taken over by this case. It's the only case I know of in the employment tribunals. It's first instance, so not binding. But in this particular case, it was argued on behalf of the claimant um, because the claimant was impecunious, citing the Equality Act, also ECHR and various other arguments that the tribunal should fund an intermediary to aid communication. And that was a successful argument, but not binding. But I want to highlight here, the impecunious claimant. Well, what happens if the claimant has money? Do they have to pay it themselves? Will a respondent company, maybe insurer backed, maybe not, ever be able to argue that they need money from the state to pay for an intermediary for one of their witnesses? Well, because they're a company, is a tribunal going to buy that argument? So there does seem to be a tension there between claimant and respondent as to the availability of funds. So what else does the intermediary do? Or well, meet the party, prepare a report that's shared with, mo uh, with all people, pretty much. Um, and also may recommend how we should ask the questions and on what topics. 
Uh, and what's interesting is that many criminal advocates, old hacks who were brilliant criminal advocates, have now changed their style across the board to say, actually, I don't need to ask our questions in the old way anymore. I'm going to ask them in this new way as guided by intermediaries, which is very plain, which is very step one, step two, step three, with lots of signposting telling that vulnerable witness where you are going. Last couple of slides now. I've talked about submitting questions in advance for approval. It really sticks in the throat as an advocate, but don't be surprised if this type of order is made in particular circumstances. So as a summary, step one, we need to identify that vulnerable party. We know the obligations on us and the tribunal. We need to tell the tribunal early. I'd say list the case in front of the employment judge as quickly as possible. Try and tie it with the preliminary hearing. Try and attach it to the agenda, because at least this way, we're not paying more money, or our clients aren't paying more money, to in, uh, attend different hearings at different stages. The parties attend the ground rules hearing. Again, best practice for the intermediary to attend. They should almost always be there. And then ground rules hearing can take place at the start of the trial, but this should be avoided. And that's not just for the witness, it's not just for the tribunal. As an advocate, I'd want to know what the rules of the game were to help with my preparation before turning up. If these ground rules are sprung on us on the day, well, that could be ripping out pages of notes that are now um, inappropriate. But there is an inevitable consequence, I'm afraid to say. Most often respondents are going to incur additional fees for representation if their case involves vulnerable witnesses. Therefore, we need to try and bundle hearings together. So rather than just having a two hour prelim, let's list it for half a day, let's list it for four hours to really work through these issues. After that, there's likely to be one further hearing that's the ground rules hearing at some point in advance of the trial. Um, but again, um, it's unlikely you'll be able to deal with the ground rules hearing at the preliminary hearing because you won't have enough information at that point. So that is my talk on vulnerable witnesses, vulnerable parties. As I say, I'm writing a course at the moment, hopefully to be delivered in September, October. But if we're in the same situation as we are there uh, now, then I'm gonna have to put that on ice because the only way to deliver that, um, that type of course uh, is based upon human interaction in small groups in those intensive sessions. Uh, that's my talk. I'm gonna hand over now to Matt Jackson dealing with the cloud video platform. I think the screen will go blank now or at least to the slide. We'll hear some shuffling and Matt will be with you in about 30 seconds time. Thank you. is the cloud video platform. Uh, some of you may have seen this morning that there has been a new update to the EAP practice direction, hopefully in time for me to be prepared for this talk. And um, once I've told you what it says, you may say, well, what have you told us about? Because it's not very much has changed. But um, just to give you some idea, uh, what that new practice direction says is that there is going to be, remember this is the EAT, not the tribunal, uh, that if you're going through the process of consenting to a single judge, that's now changed in a separate process within that practice direction. Uh, there is going to be from today a default that all hearings in the Employment Appeal Tribunal will be in person. So the old practice direction until the last uh, week or so, where everything had been default remotely, is now over. Uh, there is now a position in place where there can be hybrid hearings in the EAT uh, that can be either with people, some remotely, some in the hearing, a mixture of the two with the judge and the parties. And it's also going to be the case that, uh, as you would expect from before, there's no recording being allowed by anyone other than the EAT, whether or not it's a hybrid hearing or whether or not it's a hearing with people in person. Uh, the position for most of the things hasn't changed. The only difference is for any hybrid or fully remote hearing, it will now be necessary 
for there to be a publishing of lists so that people can attend remote hearings in public, whether they want to watch just as a journalist, as a member of an audience, or however they want to. So that's fresh off the press this morning. Uh, hopefully it won't come as a great surprise, but the uh, main part of what I'm going to be talking to you about is going to be remote hearings in the employment tribunal. Uh, so at the moment, uh, we're working on the basis of three main platforms. That's the cloud video platform, which is part of the main topic, Teams hearings and Skype for business. Um, you will probably be aware, obviously because you're attending this particular talk via Zoom, uh, that there is a ban by HMCTS on the use of Zoom. In practice, I have heard some anecdotal evidence that certain hearings in family proceedings are going ahead by Zoom. I've not yet heard anything about tribunal hearings going ahead in the same way. Anyone who wants to say something in the chat about the way their hearings have gone ahead, please do. Um, I'll take a look. I think the rest will take a look about how these hearings are going ahead. Majority of the hearings I've been involved with in the tribunal have been going ahead via the cloud video platform. A few have been taking place in Microsoft Teams and some, but even fewer in the tribunal, taking place for Skype for Business. The general rule is going to be that most hearings before the CVP comes into place will be done via Teams or Skype for Business. They are the current systems and they are still, depending on which tribunal you're in, the most common ways of going ahead. Bristol is the exception, as far as I'm aware, the hearings I've done, Bristol seems to be slightly ahead of many other places, both in terms of which method of uh, platform they're using, but also whether hearings are going ahead at all. There is a different use across the court state. So for example, um, I've done some hearings in the EAT and in the high court in employment matters. They've both been via Skype for business, you will probably know whether you've uh, been using Skype for Business or not. Skype for Business is entirely out of date. It hasn't been properly updated for around about three years. So the, the idea is to move away from Skype for Business eventually. At the moment though, uh, it still seems to be quite popular in the EAT and the High Court. It will eventually be phased out, but however you get into it, whether it's CVP or one of these two forms of access, the way you get in is essentially the same. And that is, you'll get an email. Now, I appreciate on this screen, it may be a bit small, so I'll, I'll read some of what it says. This is an email I had for a hearing in the EAT a couple of weeks ago. It might not be immediately obvious where it is on there, but if you have a look towards the bottom of the screen in this area here, you can see you'll get a link which you click on that takes you into that Skype meeting. This is a Skype for business. You'll get a similar email if you have a Teams meeting. But what you get when you click through that Skype for Business link is a screen that looks like this. But what you'll get is, first of all, message here telling you that your meeting is ready to open. This is assuming that you have the Skype for Business platform installed. But you'll also see here at the top of the screen, uh, there is an option to either open Skype for Business or cancel. And of course, if you have it, you'll need to click here where it says open Skype for Business. That will take you into the platform as it works. So that's your link there to get in. And that is, if you don't have it installed at the bottom here, you can use the web app. So if you don't have Skype for Business installed, you need to click the option at the bottom. This is whether you use the web app or not, pretty much what you'll see. And there's a pretty blank screen when you first get in there. It looks a bit different when you get into the final hearing, but I'll show you what some of the controls look like when you're using them. So first of all, you'll see here at the bottom of the screen, a set of options. The first option here on the left, that is your camera. You'll need to choose that to turn your camera on and off because when you come into these hearings by default, it's off. Same with number two, as we go across for the microphone, that is generally speaking off when you're taken into the meeting in the first place. Third one is what we've had a bit of joy with this morning already with the screen share option. I can say even with hearings with bundles involved, I've not used that screen share option at all and neither has anyone else. The general preparation has been, everyone has either an electronic or a paper bundle before they get into the hearing. 
Number four, you should tell by, be able to tell by the red button and the hang up, that's how you get out of the meeting. And what you'll see, broadly speaking, once you have your participants in the hearing, is a big square at the top with your main participant, usually that will be the judge who starts the hearing, or their clerk if they have one, and then everyone else underneath. And that will include your picture, assuming that you've got your video camera set up in such a way that it can see you and that everything's working. The cloud video platform is a little different. Again, it's quite a dense email, and it might not be entirely easy to see the link that I've circled there. So I've used high-tech technology so that you can see where you'll find that link. It's just there at the top where it says click here. It'll take you through ZCVP in a similar way. As I say, this will depend on your tribunal. You'll see from this email when you get the slide, this is one from Bristol. Different tribunals are doing similar things, but Bristol seems to be a little ahead in terms of its use of CVP. Once you click through that link, uh, you'll get taken to this screen. Um, this portion of the screen here will be filled in. I've blanked out the email address just to avoid at some point judge having people joining their hearings by mistake. But the conference alias is the person inviting you. Don't change what that says if it's come through in the right way. Uh, you'll need to put in your name in the bottom here. And that's the name that will show up as you get on to the system and how it will appear to everyone else. The next thing just below that, though, is the settings option. And I recommend whether you're doing this for CVP, Skype for Business, Teams, anything else, you should check these settings before you get to your hearing, not sort of 10 minutes before, but do it the day before if you can, because you can log into these hearings with nobody there and make sure this is working. <coughs> what you'll see if you click that settings option is something that looks a bit like this. And what you need to keep an eye on is this box in the top of the screen that you will see when you get there, because it will ask you to use your microphone and to use your camera. If you click block, the hearing is not going to work. The first time it does it, it will ask you this, and you must make sure you click allow, because that then allows you to change your settings, fill in the screen, and make sure that everything is where it needs to be once the hearing's underway. Uh, one thing I will say, um, you may, may have seen some guidance about the use of Google Chrome. It is quite important to bear in mind, Chrome is probably the safest option in terms of Windows programs. Um, I've certainly heard quite a few colleagues of mine, I don't know uh, others have heard similar, where if you're using uh, non-Windows products, so Macintosh or Linux, Chrome is sometimes difficult. And this is one of those reasons you'll want to check before your hearing is started what's happening. Mac seems to be better with uh, Safari. Uh, Linux seems to change depending on what you get. I know a colleague used Microsoft Edge as well, and it doesn't seem to have any problem. It's best to check before you get to your hearing, because otherwise this could simply all go wrong. Similarly to uh, Skype, if you're into the meeting and you've joined it, this is how the cloud video platform looks, and it's not any different at all. Uh, you will get a PIN code if you get a CVP meeting that you don't with others uh, that you'll need to enter before you get here. But when you're in, this is what it will look like. These two parts of the screen, one at the top, one at the bottom, are your picture. You'll see that the controls at the bottom, they're in a slightly different order, but they're exactly the same as they are for Skype. There's some additional controls down here in the bottom part of the screen. They look similar, but they're not quite the same. Number one looks like you're turning your sound on and off. This is the sound you hear, so don't make the mistake that someone made in the hearing I've done They've turned that off thinking that they're not being heard by anyone and everyone can hear the conversation they're having about how rubbish the judge is. Don't do that, it's usually bad. Uh, the second one is change the camera. So you will have set up your default camera on the screen when you enter to that settings menu. If you have other cameras on your system, often people have a laptop with a front facing and a back facing camera, you can change it on there. Again, don't choose that unless you want the judge to be looking at what you've got behind with your old sweet wrappers and your dead coffee cups. Number three is simply the statistics for the hearing. It just tells you how much information's come and gone on the know with them. It's not of any interest at all. And number four is the full screen option. <coughs> They're not dissimilar on Skype for Business, but you'll find them in different places. Uh, the screen at the top there is where before the meeting starts, you'll see your own camera to make sure it works. Oddly, you'll also see yourself down at the bottom here as well, uh, but the bottom one disappears once the hearing's got started. 
Uh, this is in a similar way how the hearing will look. You will see a similar screen with the main screen at the top and four underneath. You will see a picture of yourself in the top right. I know some people have found this distracting. Um, there is a little marker there. You can see the arrow pointing towards. If you click that marker, that will get rid of that image of yourself and you can watch uh, without anything else on there. Once the hearing's also started, you'll see down on this side, there's a list of participants. And then underneath there is a chat function, very similar to the ones that uh, you're using now. <coughs> the chat function is not generally being used by most people. There are a couple of occasions I've seen where a judge has asked people to put into chat if they're having any difficulty with a, a bit of video or they're disappearing, but just let them know they're still there. So it's not generally used, but you'll see who's in the hearing in that participants box. So uh, the next thing then, this is some general tips I'll go into about how you get the most out of any video hearing, no matter which form you're using. Uh, first of all, have a look at your camera setup. Lots of people will have a single webcam and therefore they don't have any choice, it's what's in the laptop. But bear in mind, uh, if you're looking down at your laptop like this, as you're seeing the top of my head now, it's not quite as engaging if you're looking up at the camera and you can see people face to face. People like me who have quite a large nose also have a difficult problem that you can see all the way up. So if you can, put your camera higher up. If you have a choice, maybe put some books behind it, but make sure you're looking straight into the camera. It's better, judges have better engagement with it. People seem to find the hearings go better. Secondly, make sure your screen setup's in the right place, and I'll go into more detail for that in a minute. Thirdly, check your background, and then finally, make sure your internet's working. And I'll go into again some more detail about that in a second. So as I've said, with the camera setup, ideally just above your eye line, there is software you can get entirely for free, depending who makes your webcam, that can adjust the image. So a lot of webcams, for example, will have large breadths of area either side that you can't see anything other in than anything in, excuse me. And um, if you have software that can adjust it so the camera is looking here at your face, again, that's better. It's easier for judges to see what you're doing, what you're saying you can get engaged. Um, for example, lots of people have Logitech cameras. One of those options is uh, Logitech uh, Compress, I think is the word. And there's also a similar position with something called outside broadcaster services. Lots of people who use it for streaming online and Twitch, which I'm sure you'll all be familiar with. Uh, you can use it as well in exactly the same way with a plugin for the camera. Make sure the room you're in is well lit. And by that, I mean, for example, don't sit in front of a window. If the window's behind you, all that anyone will see on the screen is a silhouette. If you can have lights reflecting off a neutral wall back onto you, that way judges again can see you better and it's easier for people to engage in the hearing. And look at the camera in exactly the same way. If I'm giving this talk, looking over there at some notes that someone's given, people over this way, which everyone who's watching this, doesn't feel engaged. I'm not engaging with you. If you're looking at the camera, that is the best way. The judge can see you, looks like the judge is looking at you, and the same is the case with witnesses. They think that you're looking at them, not just something else. Screen setup's a bit more difficult because not everyone has all the options everyone would want. Uh, if you can, dual screening, having a second screen attached, or an ultra-wide screen is amazing for remote hearings. There is so much that you have on the screen. Most of us will have electronic bundles. Most of us will have notes written down in one way or another. And if you have something, you're fiddling around in the screen to find it, you're going to get distracted. If you have the option of a screen like this, this is the one that I use, and you can see it's a 34 inch wide ultra wide screen. It's basically the same as two 22 inch screens next to each other. You can have your Bundle here on the right hand side. Up here you can have the CVP platform or anything else. You can also have uh, any notes you've got, skeletons, notes of earlier hearings. As I've said, software, bundles, scan statements, anything like that. I use the bottom section for things like notes of the hearing, sometimes for things like making my own notes, sometimes for notes for my speaking. It depends on personal usage, but if you can set your screen up 
So you have things in this way, or double screens as the case may be, you can have so much more at your fingertips and it makes easier, it makes hearings much easier when you have to do them remotely. Not everyone has that choice, obviously, but if you can find some way of having a small laptop screen or even just a small iPad, because I've, I've seen people and talked to people who've tried to do hearings on iPads, they just don't work. The background also of some importance, as I've said, avoid having windows behind you, light sources in the camera shot, it can be very distracting. If you can, a neutral background best, but don't obsess over that. As long as you're happy with what can be seen in the background, you're fine. I'm sure a number of you may well recall about seven or eight years ago, I think there was an interview that somebody was doing on BBC News just after uh, the Boston Marathon bombing. And there was an item, which I shan't name, on the top of their fridge, which I suspect they probably would rather people hadn't seen. As long as there's nothing like that in your background, don't obsess over it too much. The most important thing is that everyone can see you and be seen. Uh, finally, a last point on your internet connection. It is important to have a stable connection. If people keep dropping out all the way through the hearing, it's not going to be effective. You're gonna have a very grumpy judge. Avoid doing it on mobile internet if possible. I know it's not always an option, but mobile internet is generally less stable than Wi-Fi or even an ethernet connection to a hardwired cable. If you can avoid Wi-Fi, because again, ethernet connections direct to your router are better, they are more stable. And in general, if you follow those tips, that's the best way you can have for your CVP hearing. It's a lot in a nutshell in a short period of time. Sorry for racing through it, but if anyone wants to ask me any questions, I'm looking at the screen now. I've got a bit of time before we have to move on. Doesn't look like anything's coming, but I'll give you a second or two more just in case anyone's typing. Ah, we've got a, a, mess, a question from Amaya. How do you communicate with your client? The most straightforward way uh, um, is to have, if it's during the course of a hearing, is to have either some sort of either WhatsApp or email group set up so you can email back and forth. If you're talking about during breaks in the hearings, what I've had set up with my solicitors, separately from uh, the CVP or the Teams meeting, I've had a Zoom group set up so that we can chat with one another in exactly the same way as we would have chatted during a uh, lunch break or any other break in the hearing. Matt, may I just jump in on that as well, please? Um, I think the camera is going to swing around to us now. You can see that other than the speaker and the person that's speaking, we have our face coverings and we're wiping down our stations. Um, in answer to your question, Mia, there's a, a number of ways of doing it. WhatsApp is the most effective. And to, um, for the bigger hearings, the more complicated hearings, you may want a WhatsApp group with the other lawyers. You may want a WhatsApp group with just your client to take instructions. And you may want a WhatsApp group with your, uh, let, let's say, um, you've got an expert involved who's commenting on the way forward, or you've got a paralegal who's assisting you or whatever. So to have these subdivided WhatsApp groups, but also you might want to have a WhatsApp group which includes just the advocates and the judge. So if there's a problem in, the te in relation to the technology or the connection, then it, that people can be alerted to that automatically. Certainly large criminal trials using CVP and similar have adopted that um, compartmentalized WhatsApp sharing approach. And it seemed to be pretty effective from everything that I've read. That's just my two penneth. And I think we do have one other question uh, from Sean, which is what is the best electronic bundle package? Uh, this will depend on how you're working. The one that I've been using when I've had to put together consolidated statements, skeletons and evidence bundles is called Foxit Phantom PDF. Other people use the full version of Adobe Pro. Um, I know that there's PDF experts, another one. You sort of have to experiment with all of them because they will all give you a free trial. Phantom PDF is, I think, the cheaper of the three because you have to purchase all of them in order to put things together. Um, it does everything I've ever needed it to. It can paginate, you can insert new pages, you can insert from scanners, insert pages from other files. 
that's the one I use. Different people will have different options. And of course, some uh, firms may have specific software packages they've already purchased. The only important thing I will say is if you're putting together an electronic bundle, please make sure that the PDF page numbers are the same as the printed page numbers. So you're starting your page number from the index rather than from the first document. Because the first thing that goes wrong with, with hearings with electronic bundles is people having different page numbers. If you can avoid that, it keeps your judge a lot less grumpy. And as Rich will tell you, less grumpy judges are generally better. Uh, that's it, I think, in terms of the questions. So I'm going to hand over now to Lucy. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about job offers, new starters and frustration. As Richard has already alluded to in his presentation, I have um, started learning some British Sign Language. I'm still at a very basic level, but in terms of introducing myself, hello, my name is Lucy. And I'm, as I've said, I'm here to talk to you about job offers, new starters and frustration. Um, I don't know the sign for frustration, but it may be something like, yeah. And as we can see, these people here are definitely having a frustrating time. Um, so that's my um, way of introduction. introduction. Um, if we start, first of all, with job offers, so I will say as a caveat, first of all, that I am running through these topics at a very basic level. Um, some of you may already know a lot of these things, but the reason why I'm doing that is because there will be significantly increased focus um, now on job offers and whether section one statements have been complied with and um, there may be more arguments with regards to frustration of contract because of the coronavirus situation um, so i apologize now if this is is very basic for some of you but we all do need a, a refresher on it um, first of all job offers it's better to be in writing but that's not compulsory you can see on the slide here there are two types of job offer unconditional which is the job is offered and then accepted if that is the choice of the person who is being offered the job or conditional so the conditions could be um, completing training um, finishing qualifications that kind of thing and if the offer is accepted and the conditions are complied with then again that is a binding contract between um, the employer and the employee or worker. Um, there was um, a case recently on vicarious liability. So if um, an employer required somebody to undertake a medical examination and, for example, they were assaulted during the course of that examination, so the case I'm referring to is various claimants against Barclays, um, the decision at Court of Appeal was that the employer would be vicariously liable for any of that person's conduct. But the reason why I bring that up is because that case has recently gone to the Supreme Court. I think the judgment came out in April, which um, said that actually that's not the situation. We do need to look at the um, test for vicarious liability. So is there a relationship akin to employer and employee? and was um, the tort sufficiently connected to that relationship for the employer to be responsible. Um, I would recommend if you do have a case involving vicarious liability that you go away and, and read that judgment. But I did want to flag it because that is a very recent change from what the position was um, from the Court of Appeal. So once the offer is accepted, if the employer withdraws the offer, then there is potentially some recourse, but it depends on the situation. So number one here on the slide, if the um, offer is withdrawn for a discriminatory reason, then the employee can go to the employment tribunal and bring a claim for discrimination. If it's for an unacceptable or automatically unfair reason, then again, the employee can bring a claim for unfair dismissal. Some of you may have joined us for our Zoom seminar 
um, at the beginning of the lockdown. And during that, I focused on um, Section 100 of the Employment Rights Act, which was health and safety related dismissals. In that situation, it's an automatically unfair dismissal. So I bring that up and remind you of it because of the coronavirus situation. It may be a more common um, reason for job offers being withdrawn if somebody isn't comfortable starting their employment when they're expected to. Um, and dismissal because of a request for flexible working is also a scenario um, that is relevant here. And that's something that Alec will be talking to you about once I finished my presentation. If the job offer was unconditional or the conditions were met, then that's a breach of contract. And that claim can be brought either in the employment tribunal or the county court. So that's a decision for the employee where they feel most comfortable bringing their claim and that it would also have an impact on um, time limits as well. Um, because of course, there's a, a more limited time limit for bringing a claim in the employment tribunal. If the con it's a conditional offer and the conditions aren't met, well then unfortunately that's the end of the matter. There's no recourse. That's that finished. Now, what about the situation where the employee says, I appreciate the offer, but no thanks. Now, I'm doing this action simulating this picture, not because that's actually British sign language for what that means. I haven't got that far through um, my sign language training yet. So please don't be going around doing that um, and saying this is what it means, because I'm not sure if that is what it means. I'm not sure if it might be offensive. Um, <laughs> so I'm just recreating this. But in that situation, if the employee withdraws once the contract is binding, the employer can require them to work the notice period in the contract. Now, whether an employer would want that to be done, it depends. Because the notice period, it could be one week, for example. And would you want to create bad relations, potentially create more work as an employer um, expecting somebody to work for one week instead of using that time constructively to find somebody else to fill that position and of course you might want to consider probationary periods as well um, if a probationary period does apply then it may not be worth asking the employee to carry on um, during the period of, of notice the other situation is the employer could sue the employee for breach of contract. And again, it would be a weighing up exercise of whether it would be worth the time and effort of doing that. And that probably depends very much on what the contract is in the first place. So, the one thing I want to, to finish on um, with job offers before we move on is that the job offer should inform the employee of the terms and conditions um, under which they will be working and the commencement date and time as well. So this brings me on to new starters. So again, hello, my name is new employee. That actually was the correct sign language for that introduction. So if you do want to go and recreate that and use it yourself, that is correct. So what I'm going to focus on is changes that have been made to um, Section 1 statements under the Employment Rights Act 1996. So the new changes apply to any new employees who began their employment after the 6th of April 2020. One of the other significant changes is that the provisions now extend to workers, whereas previously it was solely employees. So workers can now also make a complaint to the employment tribunal if they're not given a section one statement. Another significant change is that most of the particulars of employment must be contained within one principal statement, whereas previously, it could have been a principal statement, a secondary statement and other accompanying documents. But now most of the particulars must be in the one statement. The statement must be provided on or before the first day of employment. And again, that's a significant change because the previous position was that it could be provided 
any time up to um, the completion of the first two months of employment. And you'll see from the slide as well at the bottom, there's no minimum period of employment to be eligible, whereas previously the employee had to have um, been employed for one month before they were eligible for the Section 1 statement. Some of the information that should be in um, the principal statement, my apologies, I'll go back a slide, um, are the days of the week the person must work, the times they must work, if the hours vary, what that variation is and how it's decided, details of any paid leave, details of any benefits that the employee is entitled to, details of any probationary period, including length and conditions attached to the probationary period, details of training entitlements, including if training is compulsory and any cost that the employee might have to um, bear the burden of. Notice periods for both parties to the contract. If the work is for a fixed period, the length of that period. Any terms relating to working outside of the UK, if the employee is expected to work outside of the UK for longer than one month. And on the top of this slide, you can see that certain information can still be provided in a reasonably accessible document within two months of starting employment, provided that the principal statement makes reference to the reasonably accessible document that would be provided in due course. So things that can be included in that reasonably accessible document um, are things such as paid leave, pensions, training, um, information on disciplinary and grievance procedures. The Employment Tribunal's powers remain the same regarding remedy, so if there is no separate substantive claim then the only remedy is a declaration that either the um, particulars are correct or an amendment to them. And any complaint to the Tribunal must be made within three months from the end of the employment. An existing employee or a former employee who left within three months can request a new Section 1 statement once. And that new Section 1 statement must comply with the new provisions that are in force from the 6th of April. If there are any changes to the particulars that must be provided under the new provisions, and there hasn't been any previous request for a new Section 1 statement, then the employer must provide details of what the changes are under Section 4 of the Employment Rights Act, and that must be in a written statement. So this brings us on to frustration of contract. So frustration occurs where performance of the contract is impossible or substantially different from that which was contemplated when the contract was entered into. And you'll know it does say impossible, that can be commercially or physically impossible, just because it would be more expensive or it's harder to get um, goods to perform the contract. That's not sufficient, it has to be impossible. In addition, it must be due to reasons of an unforeseen and unprovided for event with no fault or default on the part of either party. And a case that um, is useful for whether an event is unforeseen is a case of Canary Wharf T1 Limited and European Medicines Agency, which is a 2019 authority. And in that case, the European Medicines Agency had taken out a 25-year lease for premises in London. Within that contract, there were inducements um, within it that wouldn't have been provided if there was a break clause within the contract. When Brexit happened, the European Medical Agency tried to argue that there was frustration of contract and they should be entitled to um, end their lease early. And what the court said was, yes, Brexit perhaps was an unforeseen event, but leaving the contract early wasn't unforeseen. Therefore, there wasn't any frustration of contract because if 
there wasn't some consideration of leaving the contract early, they wouldn't have had the inducements that, inducements that they did. So it's not necessarily that the event, it's, um, the events such as Brexit needed to be foreseen, but they considered whether there was contemplation of leaving the lease early, which was the relevant point. And what that case tells us is that frustration of contract is considered very strictly and the courts won't allow it to be used to escape a bad bargain. So examples of when a contract might be frustrated, if a new statute prevents performance, so performing the contract would actually be unlawful, illness, disability, if somebody is imprisoned. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about if someone's imprisoned because that speaks for itself really. The leading case on illness is Williams and Watson's Luxury Coaches Limited and what that case said was the court needs to look at the true situation so the court will look to see if actually um, the contracts being ended for for example a redundancy situation or a disability situation um, they won't just accept on face value if somebody says well the contract's frustrated that's that the court will examine what the circumstances are and you'll see from this slide as well the date of the alleged frustration is very useful to help decide what the true situation is because the court will look at a number of factors which I'll come on to in a moment and particularly what's being said and done at that time to see what the true situation actually is. And the factors that I've just alluded to come from Eggstore, Stamford Hill Limited and Libavici. And those are the length of the previous employment, how long the employment was expected to last, the nature of the job, the nature, length and effect of the illness or disabling event, the need for the work to be done and for a replacement to do that work, risk to the employer of acquiring obligations for redundancy pay, compensation from fair dismissal, that kind of thing to the replacement employee, whether wages continued to be paid, the acts and statements of the employer in relation to the employment dismissal, or failure to dismiss the employee. So this is what I've just referred to where the court will look at all of the circumstances and in particular conversations that were being had and people's actions at the time. And whether a reasonable employer could be expected to wait longer before trying to rely upon frustration. And with disability in particular, you will see if there's a failure to make reasonable adjustments, there's no frustration. And if you think it through, that follows because it's not that performance of the contract is impossible. It is possible if the reasonable adjustments are, are put into place, the contract would be able to continue if that was done. So that's a very, very important factor when um, disability is alleged as a frustrating event. So whether a reasonable employer could be expected to wait longer before finding that there's been frustration, this case is very important on that point. Griff Lauksowski and Hinchinbrook Healthcare NHS Trust. And the facts of that case are that a consultant general and colorectal surgeon who had been on special leave for two years following a referral to the National Clinical Assessment Authority had to complete a period of retraining at another NHS trust before he could return to his employment with Hinchinbrook Healthcare. NHS Trust. Hinchinbrook tried to argue that well the contract's frustrated and it's come to an end that's the end of it but what the court looked at was whether in that situation the NHS Trust should have been expected to wait longer because in not doing so it would have had such a catastrophic effect on that individual's ability to work for an NHS trust ever again that actually they should have waited longer because performance of the contract wasn't impossible it was possible he just had to undergo some training first and that so that is very very important if it's just a case of they could wait but they don't want to because it inconveniences them well you need to look at what the 
magnitude of the consequence would be um, and the court will be very the tribunal will be very very interested in that if the contract is frustrated termination is automatic in law there's no dismissal no ability to claim from fair dismissal no ability to claim for redundancy and no ability to claim for wrongful dismissal so as i'd said in relation to what i'm going to call the brexit case the courts will be very, very reluctant to um, allow frustration to be used to escape a bad bargain, but also they apply these principles very, very strictly because it prevents any claim for any of these things, which may, if the contract wasn't frustrated, be alleged. So it does have quite broad ramifications um, for, for further claims. Um, a few points that aren't on the slides that I just want to make to finish off is that if an employee has provided um, some part of the contract, performed some part of, part of it, then they can expect to receive payment for it, regardless of whether there's been a frustrating event. Where there is frustration, then the parties can't agree that the contract continues anyway, because as this slide shows, termination is automatic in law. That's the end of it. You can't just agree to carry on. And a party alleging frustration can't rely upon frustration induced by their own default or their own actions. So in this previous case, Hinchinbrook Healthcare NHS Trust, if the frustration was induced by Hinchinbrook, as an example, then that would be another situation where they couldn't rely on frustration because it would be, have been because of their own conduct. Um, that is just an example by using the facts of this case it isn't actually what the case said, um, just to be clear there. Um, I'll leave you with this funny meme, and this is a clip from a screenshot from a video. I'm sure it reminds many of you of what it's been like working from home. And I would recommend that you do Google uh, BBC interview interrupted by child if you want to see that video. It's very, very funny. And I assure you, it will brighten up your day if my sign language hasn't already done that. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> right. Just getting used to where I am in shot. So I'm looking at working from home requests and the new world that we're sort of living in generally at the moment. The world has changed. Um, this is only, I think, the second time in three months um, that I've worn trousers um, with my suit jacket. Um, don't judge me. I know you're all doing it. Uh, it's one of the reasons also we stood up to make sure that we are appropriately dressed when we're all in the same room rather than just wearing shorts maybe some sandals which i've um, been quite wont to do of late my office is now my spare room um, and it has lots of advantages over courtrooms i have a standing desk if i so wish it cranks up um, i have better light i don't just have to drink cold water and i have the advantages of an emotional support cat He's not very good at that, if I'm honest, he's an arsehole. <laughs> UK workers say they will continue to work from home after lockdown is eased. And this is actually almost a month ago now. 60% of people would like to work from home more often. Two thirds would like to work from home two or three times a week. And 25% want to pay the, the an office a visit only one day a week. So already we are seeing that as we've put people in their homes to do most of their work, a lot of people are actually finding they quite enjoy it. I'm, for instance, really enjoying not having to drive halfway across the country every day to do a 10 minute mention. Um, it really has brought home just the sheer amount of time that I spend in my car to go and do hearings, which we now discover could have been done from home for years in fact this technology we're using now is not exactly new we're just very used to using it now and even what we were doing three months ago is completely different from what we're doing now 
84% of people say it is important for employers to offer staff the option of working from home. Of course, they already had that option. We've had this option for several years. Homeworking largely falls under two areas at the tribunal. So if we're talking about employment claims, we're going to talk about these two areas. Reasonable adjustments under the Equality Act and flexible working requests under the Employment Rights Act 1996. And we'll look at that one first. So this governs requests for flexible working. And it, it may not be an area of law that you've actually seen a lot of because it doesn't actually get to the tribunal a huge amount. But it's quite straightforward. A qualifying employee, or well that's an employee who has six months of service, may apply for what is a permanent change. This isn't just a sort of temporary thing. They can say, I want to change my terms and conditions to this. In respect of the hours that they work, the times that they work, and also the locations that they work, be that from home or at different offices that the employer may have. Applications in writing must make clear that they are statutory applications to change terms and conditions. It must state what it is in order to gain the full benefits that follow. It must specify the change. So whatever you think as the employer, you want as the employee to happen, you should set out quite clearly, I want to do this. And you should explain what effect, if any, the employee thinks making the change to apply for would have on his employer or her, and how, in his opinion, any such effect might be dealt with. So they've got to set forward what they want to do, what their plan is, but also do a bit of a sell, explain why they think it's a good idea and what sort of conditions could be put in place to mitigate any losses. The work then falls on the employer. Having received an application, the employer shall deal with it. So it's not the sort of thing you can just sweep under the rug and ignore. You have to deal with it if you're an employer. But you have to do so in just what is a reasonable manner. And you have to notify the employee of the decision within either three months um, or an agreed period of time. So you can agree with your employees that it could be less time or longer time. And you can decline on one of the following grounds. Now it says only, but it's actually quite a long list. So you've got the burden of additional costs, the detrimental effect on the ability to meet customer demand, the inability to reorganize work among existing staff, the inability to recruit additional staff. There's more, the detrimental impact on quality, the detrimental impact on performance, insufficiency of work during the periods the employee proposes to work, planned structural changes and such other grounds as the Secretary of State may specify by regulations. You don't have to worry about the last one so much because I'm not aware there have been any. But as I'm sure you'll agree, that's quite a long list of things for which an employer could pin their response to. ACAS has produced a guide, it's Code of Practice 5, and it's actually a very short document. And it's so short and so straightforward that there is no excuse really not to just grab it out if you're an employer when you receive a request or even before you receive your requests. See what it says and just do it. it it's so straightforward. It puts forward what is a really simple way to deal with these requests, outlining both the legal requirements and also what they think you should be doing. So when you read the guidance, it will say there are things you must do because the law says so and things that you should do because they're saying that is the best practice available. So they suggest accompanied meetings. Of course, accompany, accompaniment is optional, but they recommend that you have a meeting with the employee after they've made their application. You should provide written reasons to the employee if you're going to say yes or no, or even if you're going to suggest a sort of compromise. You should have a further meeting if the request is going to be accepted. So that way you can set out what the ground rules are, what the plan is. And also if you've got any modifications that you want to put forward to the employee's plan. And also discussing when to start. They also recommend an appeal process. Now it's important to bear in mind that if you have an appeal process, which of course is optional because this is what ACAS is suggesting, having the appeal process doesn't automatically add on time um, 
in the three months. So if you have the appeal process, your three month deadline to bringing in the conclusion to the request still exists. So if you, you have to fit all of it in the three months, unless of course you agree with the employee to a different period of time. So you can actually agree retrospectively or during the process to extend the deadline um, if you're going to put in an appeal. So you could get to the three months, then have the appeal and say to the employee, do you mind if we extend the deadline? And they could say yes. But they might, of course, say no, in which case it's best to plan around the three months. An employee can complain to the employment tribunal that the employer has failed to comply with their duties. Now their duties include, of course, responding reasonably and also following the law in that you can only use one of those acceptable categories. Or if the employer has refused an application on incorrect facts, and we'll look at that point in a second. So you've got the three month time limit. If you don't comply the three month time limit, you can also be taken to the ET. Um, but also there is a second three month time limit to bring the claim as of other claims. But you can also use the ACAS conciliation um, system to gain a bit more time um, on your limitation. The ET's powers, however, are pretty minimal. Um, they can order reconsideration of the application, but they can't make the employer do anything. It's a bit like judicial review. They can turn around and say, no, nope, think about it again but the employment tribunal can't turn around and say, you were wrong, you should give them what they've asked for. The compensation is also limited to eight weeks pay. Um, so it's not a huge uh, gain if you are successful and this is your only claim. However, an employee is protected against detriment and dismissal on the ground that they made an application. So it, you can't, get rid of someone because they made an application for flexible working um, or bought proceedings under this um, section of the RA. So you can't then dismiss them um, because they complained that you didn't agree to their flexible working requests. Those are straightforward um, concepts and other aspects of dismissal. There isn't a lot of case law and that's primarily for reasons we'll um, look at. It's, it's not actually a heavily litigated topic and that's not because people aren't doing it. Um, a 2007 survey looking at this in particular soon after it came in, and I, I haven't been able to find anything hugely more relevant more recently, found that the majority of quests that were made were dealt with informally. So it, actually employers were being very um, reasonable in allowing the requests. 60% were granted in full and a further 17% in part. So almost 80% of the requests that were made under that survey were successful. Claims to the tribunals um, were relatively low at about 250 to 300. And in 2011, there were only 227 claims of which there were 48 final hearings and only 10 findings for the claimant. Of course, that's 2011. So since then, we've had the fees. And as I'm sure you can imagine, this was probably not one of the areas of um, dispute between employees and employers um, that was hugely relevant when you had to pay £1,200 just to have your final hearing. So they should come back, but they might not for other reasons. So quickly looking at case, um, this was a case where a, wor a warehouse worker who was working full time, five days a week, um, suddenly became the primary carer for her granddaughter. So she went to her employers and said, uh, can I work three days a week? And she essentially got an out of hand response that said, um, no, we, we want to keep you as a full time employee. She appealed and the appeal said, well, no, see what we have here is we really want to create a team atmosphere. So everyone needs to work the same hours. Well, she took it to the, she resigned and she took it to the ET. She brought constructive unfair dismissal because she said that the way that they had dealt with her requests undermined the relationship of trust and confidence. Uh, and she also brought an indirect discrimination claim. And she was successful. The key points from the hearing of this, the employment tribunal looked into the facts of the, dismiss, of the dismissal of her application. Because one of the reasons that the employer the employment tribunal um, can look into claims is that if they are brought on the basis of incorrect facts, so the employment appeal tribunal said, well, obviously, if the employment tribunal is allowed to find that the employer dismissed 
an application because of incorrect facts. It stands to reason that the tribunal must be able to look at those facts in order to determine whether or not they were incorrect. So it's not just a carte blanche. You do have to actually have facts, reasons, and a reasoned response when the employer is saying yes or no, or particularly no, to these sort of applications. So you can expect if these claims go to the ET, that the ET are going to look at them. And they're going to look at them in some detail. And in the circumstances, they found that the responses that were given by the employer in this case, they were off the cuff responses. They hadn't actually done any real thinking about the process. Sorry, there's something going on in front of me. And as a result, their, um, their refusal was wrong. And of course, that meant that there was a breakdown in the fundamental relationship of trust and confidence. This, however, swings the other way. So this is a case called Whiteman and CPS Interiors. Um, Miss Whiteman worked for an interior design role, uh, and she resigned after a request for flexible working after she returned from maternity leave um, was refused. CPS rejected her requests on the basis that they had a collaborative way of designing and that they needed people to be in the same room in order to really get the best out of everyone. She'd also asked um, that she could work mainly after six o'clock in the evening. And they said, well, the problem with that is that means you're not available at the time that we need you um, if we have to change something last minute before five o'clock, for instance. So she was actually unsuccessful and she'd brought claims of underneath, uh, underneath, under this part of the ERA, as well as constructive unfair dismissal and indirect um, discrimination. The ET said that they'd acted in a reasonable manner. Um, they'd looked at her request, they'd done everything they needed to do, and their reasons were reasonable. Because if when we look back at that list that I showed you earlier, there are a lot of grounds to look at them. Um, because they'd come to a reasonable decision, that meant there wasn't a fundamental breakdown in trust and confidence because they had done what they needed to do, uh, and her claim for those two aspects was unsuccessful. Um, she also had failed to provide any real evidence for her indirect discrimination claim, so that claim um, was lost on its facts. So is this good news for employers? It's only a right to request flexible working, not to get flexible working. The ET is unlikely to interfere, I would suggest, looking at the statistics and looking at the test with a reasoned judgment put forward by an employer. However, employers need to be aware that what they could be doing when they refuse one request is in fact creating a PCP, which could have an indirectly discriminatory effect going forward. So they need to be careful that they're not putting in place a dangerous precedent. Employers should therefore be prepared to justify their reasons and full explanations while not being necessary are recommended. And remember, because Whiteman only failed on um, discrimination due to lack of evidence. I'm sure you can think of many cases where that could have been gone the other way. A reasonable manner applies to both the decision and the procedure. It's a very employer friendly test. But, and this is what's really interesting, my view is very much so that what we're going through now is going to have a profound impact upon what is reasonable. How do we think that CPS are currently working if they can't have all of their people in the office? Have they discovered new and collaborative ways to work electronically? Other firms have had to, we're having to. So that is going to have an impact on what is reasonable. If we've all spent three months working at home and it's been successful, it's gonna be very hard for the employer to turn around afterwards and say, actually, no, this isn't working. It might also go the other way. You might actually be able to say as an employer that it isn't successful because you've tried it and it didn't work. Um, there was an article in a um, newspaper this week that suggested that because they're not being so closely monitored, some employees have found that they can actually get away with doing two hours less work um, within the same amount of time. So it can swing both ways. Um, and it's gonna have an impact on the general attitude. It's gonna be much more difficult to convince a judge that you can't work from home over CVP. We'll rush for reasonable adjustments because it is quite a well-known area of law, I would hope. You've got three duties. 
you've got to take reasonable steps to ensure that provisions, criterions or practices are not putting a claimant at a, a substantial disadvantage. And then you've also got the same duty to ensure that physical features are not putting them at a disadvantage or that there is a lack of an auxiliary aid. You need to do those when you know or could be expected to know that an employee or a job applicant has a disability, which is why you put those forms forward in the first place when people are applying so that you have notice if they give it to you. If you have a disabled employee, and sometimes that's going to be obvious, other times it's not going to be obvious. Um, if they ask, you've got to do something about it. And if they are having difficulty, if you can see that they are struggling with aspects of their job, but they're not admitting it or not coming forward with it, you have a duty to say, look, let's have a chat about this. Is there something we could be doing? And that's looking at things like their sickness record, their absent record, or a delay in returning to work is because of or linked to their disability. So if they're having a lot of time off work, is it linked to a disability? Should you be doing something about it? Could you change something? So you need to identify what the PCP applied is or the physical feature of the premises or what it is that they could have which would make their life better. Identify a non-disabled comparator if it's applicable and the nature and extent of the substantial disadvantage suffered by the claimants. This is what the tribunal will be looking for. This is essentially the test. And if all those things can be found and it's found that you know, you're not making that adjustment or you could have made that adjustment, you're going to be in trouble. It's an objective standard of reasonableness and the duty to take such steps as it is reasonable to have to take either to avoid the disadvantage or in auxiliary aid cases, in provide the aid. And that includes effectiveness, practicability, cost, resources, disruption. There isn't actually anything in the Equality Act which specifies what those key factors that the employer can look at. Because you don't have to just do whatever the employee says to make their life easier, because of course it could just be ridiculously expensive and completely unreasonable. There are no factors in the Equality Act, but the factors in the Disability Discrimination Act, which preceded the Equality Act, are still relevant. The Equality Act does provide that the Secretary of State could provide a list of relevant factors, but no Secretary of State has yet done so. Homeworking, so how does this fit back into homeworking? Well, realistically, it's gonna come under the PCP heading. It's going to be much more difficult for other aspects to apply, but most of it in my, su my su suggestion is going to come under there. You could have auxiliary aids. You might have to provide the right laptops, right equipment. It's going to be much more difficult to you, for you to have a duty to change a physical feature of your employee's own home, I would suggest. A really common one is going to be attendance requirements. If you have an employee who is disabled or suffers from anxiety, that means that they struggle to get up in the mornings, requiring them to be there at nine o'clock in the morning could be unreasonable. It could be a PCP which is putting them at a disadvantage. And the onus between this area and the other area is knowledge. So once you know that there's a problem, you should be doing something about it. Don't treat the two aspects as the same. They are very different things. So for instance, with flexible working requests for non-disabled employees, the duty is just to well, the duty for reasonable adjustments is to make the adjustment, not simply to respond to a request. Because that's all that you have to do if on a flexible working request is respond to the request and say yes or no. You don't have to do anything. There is actually also a 12 month application limit for flexible working requests. So if someone makes an application for flexible working, they can't bring another one within 12 months. That does not apply to reasonable adjustments for obvious reasons. There are slides on it. I'm not going to go into it because I'm running over time, but the Health and Safety at Work Act does apply to people who are working from home. And that may mean that you have to go and look at how they're working. Is their workstation appropriate? Um, mental health considerations are going to be employment and working hours regulations still apply. So you need to, as an employer or as someone representing employers, be thinking about how are my employees doing at home? Are they OK? And I'll skip through that. Finally, we've got a lot of stuff coming in at the moment about home working. It's becoming the norm. We need to be thinking about it as we go forward. And we're going to have to have a very big conversation about it as we move out of more severe lockdown and how we deal with it going forward. Look at ACAST's checklist. 
Um, the CIPD has a helpful employee questionnaire to look at it. And also think about this, recruitment may be effective. If you've got more people working from home, are you recruiting in a wide enough area? If people don't have to commute so much, could they be working from home further away than they are now? And then you've got to be thinking about security and other things. So we're going to take a three to five minute break at this point for anyone who wants to go to the toilets, uh, make a cup of tea, and then we're going to have a question and answer session with all of us. And what would really help us if you do have a question so that we can target it at the right people responding is if you have a question just type it in now and then we can have a look at it during the break so we'll see you um, in about five minutes thanks um, welcome back everybody we've got 59 survivors so well done um, just to let you know what's been happening um, when the slides are displayed and you can't see us at all we're in fact moving base stations wiping down each station wiping down the arms making sure that we've got hand gel on and wiping down the clicker as well that's why it's quite formulaic i'm afraid you can see all of us now have got our masks under our chins rather than on those who weren't speaking were wearing masks but because we are um, two meters apart we're able to uh, do this so let's move on to our uh, questions and answers. The first one we've got here is from um, Eleanor, um, dealing with flexible working requests. Um, so clearly to Alec, uh, during a three month period in which the employer is considering a request, can an employee be compelled to continue their existing hours, location, etc.? Um, over to you, Alec. Uh, well, yes, the answer to that question is yes, um, they, are, they can be compelled because what they're asking for is a change to their um, existing um, employment contract. So until that change is agreed by the employer, the old contract continues to exist uh, in the interim. Uh, of course, that doesn't apply if it's a reasonable adjustment, in which case um, you have to be much more um, active if the problem is um, ongoing. Um I hope, Eleanor, that that's a sufficient answer. Um, I think there's probably a caveat in relation to the Equality Act and reasonable adjustments. Again, it's exactly your point about making sure you're knowing what you're dealing with in those particular circumstances. Um, another question here, um, I think Matt has already, although it's been repeated here, uh, what arrangements are, being, um, are to be made if a witness or party does not have access to any of the required components? Uh, such as a device um, or reliable internet. And parallels, of course, can be drawn here to children at home from impoverished backgrounds who aren't able to do e-learning through their teachers whilst being at home. Um, so over to you, Matt. Uh, the short answer, Heather, is it depends what kind of hearing you're looking at. If it's one where the client doesn't have to attend, my experience thus far has been that judges have said, well, I'm sorry, we'll do what we can, but we're not going to postpone hearings that the client doesn't need to be there for. So think, for example, um, a telephone preliminary hearing, uh, which is actually being conducted by uh, Zoom or uh, sorry, by cloud video platform or Teams. The judge simply says, well, it's nice if they can be there, but it's not vital. Um, the other option, and this is a particular case for trials, I've heard one example of where um, council, solicitors and clients were all in three completely different parts of the country and there were arrangements made whereby the client could either, um, if it was a tribunal near to them, go into the tribunal or if it wasn't they could have arrangements with another firm or another chambers nearby being made where they would go into by arrangement those chambers or that firm have the equipment there and be ready to go. It's not ideal, um, I know it's happened in some cases but it's the way it seems to be going. Uh, and can, may I add something to that as well, is I think probably the bigger issue there is the reliable internet, because there is absolutely nothing stopping a firm, for instance, to having a very cheap internet mobile device, no SIM card, no nothing, just with that particular app on such as Zoom or Skype or CVP, and that is the device that's put in there. When we can get tablet devices for 50, 60 quid now, um, it wouldn't surprise me if firms had a stock of a, a lending bank of technology, of cheap technology, so that can be delivered to um, witnesses or their clients who wouldn't otherwise have a device. But the difficulty there 
is then in relation to the internet. So I think actually the internet is the pinch point, not necessarily the technology. We've just had a, um, so just on that one, is there anything else in relation to that question about devices that anybody wants to follow up on? I feel like I'm doing the coronavirus briefing there. Um, nothing has come up. So the next question, it's one for um, Lucy on that. Um, thanks, Heather, uh, I've got your message. Um, one for Lucy in relation to contract frustration. Can the impact of coronavirus be considered as an unforeseen and unprovided for event? Um, that is an incredibly tricky question. I'm not going to just put it on Lucy. I'm going to put it to all four of us. I'm going to have a stab at this first of all. I don't think illness, even pandemics or viruses being spread, can be truly said to be unforeseen or unprovided for event. I, I can see why you're asking the question and it makes a lot of sense because nobody would have seen the overall impact of this. But the fact that disease, uh, that virus, bacteria, disease um, do spread and can incapacitate people, whether one, whether 20, whether 500, whether 1,000, whether 200,000, I don't think uh, would fall within the category of unforeseen, unprovided for event. That's my knee-jerk instinct um, as I stand here now. Does anybody disagree? Well, and the fact that the, you know, we've had trial runs, we've had um, experiments over the last few years to see how the government would respond to these things. They've been providing for it. Uh, whether or not they did enough is a political question, but the fact of the matter is that they still foresaw it being something which could happen. And we've seen smaller examples over recent years with other pandemics which didn't quite come Mers, to fruition SARS, et cetera. bird flu yes all those anyone things. disagree Luce? no and the other thing i would say is i've stressed the point about impossibility um particularly um you know if it's been alleged that a contract can't be complied with it needs to be actually impossible and just because it would cost more for example or there'd be more of a burden on an employer, it doesn't mean it's impossible. Um, and what I would also say is there's the factors in the case I've included in my slides. It's not as easy as saying, well, there's coronavirus, that's it. You would need to look at all of those factors, including whether it would be reasonable um, for an employer to wait longer before trying to rely upon frustration. And in this situation, everybody sort of been in the same boat in terms of businesses being shut down and help from the government to a certain extent i know there's different variations so i think it would be harder to argue that there's been frustration due to the coronavirus uh, i think i'd agree with that um, next question it's quite a long question but i'll read it out just in case whichever device you're on doesn't display the questions properly um, and i'm going to give this to matt just because um, i'm feeling naughty um, an employee is made redundant and never given a section one statement of particulars. He contacts ACAS for EC, early conciliation, uh, and is then furnished with the statement. Would this comply with section 38 of the Employment Act uh, 2002, um, given before proceedings begin? Wouldn't the fact that you have, um, have to go through compulsory to go through EC mean that proceedings begin once you contact ACAS for early conciliation and therefore the respondent is not compliant with having given the claimant the statement of particulars before proceedings begun. Surely the section one of ERA 1996 is for the employee to know the terms he is bound by and his rights whilst in employment. Um, thank you for the longest question I've ever had to uh, read out but in fact it's, it's a belter of a question. Uh, Matt over to you. Um, well, am I, that basically breaks down into about three different parts. So I'm going to take that in order if I can. First of all, when do proceedings begin? Um, Section 18 of the Employment Tribunals Act talks about relevant proceedings and the institution of early conciliation before those proceedings. So for that purpose, I don't think there's going to be much doubt proceedings begin when the claim is issued and not before. Uh, the second point is about the Section 1 statement and when there's a breach. You'll be aware that Section 1 of the Employment Rights Act says that the statement has to be given or has to be given originally within two months. Things have changed slightly, as you've heard Lucy talking about. 
The third part of that then is where do we go in terms of the Section 38 Employment Act 2002 breach proceedings? Um, I'm cheating a little bit because I've got uh, Section 38 in front of me. And Section 38 refers to a case of proceedings to which this section applies. When the proceedings were begun, the employer was in breach of his duty, or the old fashioned rather than their duties, uh, to a worker under Section 1 or under Section 4. That's when they have to make the award unless it's unjust to do so. There hasn't, as far as I'm aware, been any case law about what is meant by the words the employer was in breach of his duty and I know there's at least two different views on this. My view, for what it's worth, is the employer's in breach of their duty if they don't comply with section one or section four. So the fact that they may have assumed they're looking at employment when you had the two months to do it, served it after two months and a day, they're still in breach because you had to do it within two months. If that's the case and I'm right, that means that it doesn't matter when they serve that statement the breach is there and you can bring proceedings under section 38. There is a sizable number of people who take the different view, which is that the breach has to be in place when the proceedings are begun. I don't agree with that, but it's a perfectly valid view. And as, as I say, as far as I'm aware, uh, there is no uh, case law on this particular point. I don't think it's ever been appealed that I know of. I don't know if anyone else is aware of any case law, but for what it's worth, my view is, um, if you don't comply with the terms of 104, it doesn't matter how long afterwards the proceedings are brought, you are in breach. That's not a definitive right answer, though. Um, for what it's worth, I agree with Matt on this. I would find it an odd outcome if a technical approach due to early conciliation or whatever would inter interrupt the facts of a case where somebody is bringing a case for the failure that we've been talking about. It would seem odd that that would interrupt or cut away at the knees uh, an otherwise valid claim. That's my view of it. Uh, but I can see the technical arguments why it would go the other way. Um, I don't think there's any other questions that have quite come up. Um, I don't want to delay people if you have all got much better things to do and you're bored of looking at us. Entirely understand that, we are too. Um, therefore, um, if you have any questions, I'm just going to give it another minute for you to tap those in uh, to see if there are any further questions. I don't think so at this time. I can't see anything else coming in. Um, so unless you um, can grab us in the next 30 seconds or so, um, that is the end of this year's um, annual seminar. I think this is our 20th annual seminar. They started two years before I joined Chambers. So that means next year is our 21st anniversary of these, set, these seminars. I promise you we'll make it a big event, especially if we can all be in the same room together. We'll do something quite special. Uh, but other than that, I'm going to sign off now. May I thank my team who you can see and may I Thank you, Sky, that's very good of you. Um, and may I also thank the team behind the scenes as well. As I said, this was a shakedown. We had no idea how it was going to work. It has been largely successful, but there are certainly things that we'll take from this about how to improve for next time. Please do give us feedback. You've been sent an email with all the slides, with the presidential guidance, with our profiles, and also that feedback form. That feedback form to us is so important because the topics you put on that feedback form really do inform us for next year about what's important to you. So please just take a moment to fill those in now, send them back to us and we'll go from there. Finally, uh, and it's uh, really for your forbearance, thank you for attending today. I know these are odd circumstances. This is as best we can do at the moment, but I hope to see you very, very soon. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.